Man, that's all good. Go. Get Three, the... two, two, one. So I was heading into work the other day, and I get a text on our work group chat, and they go, a bird smacked into the window. And like they took a picture of it, and they were like, I think it's alive. But they were like scared to move it, right? How many women do so, you work with that are afraid to move a bird? More than you think, but probably not surprised. Um, <laughs> so like an hour goes by, and like I get there, right? And I'm like walking up, and I'm like, oh damn, there is a bird still here. I was like, look, I crouch down, you know, look at it. It's a cute little like, uh, probably like a sparrow or something, you know. <laughs> and I like, you know, poke it a little bit with my foot, and I'm like, oh yeah, this boy's cooked, <laughs> you know. So I like, you know, I pick it up, I move it out into like the, you know, like parking lots have like the trees and like little dirt patches. You know? Yeah, yeah. I create like a little indent, you know. I place it there, and I'm like. Cool, you know, but then I'm at work and I'm telling like the coworkers that I moved it and stuff. And I'm telling my girlfriend about it, and she's like, "Oh, you should, you know, t- let me have it, so you know she could have like the feathers or the bones or whatever." And I was like, "Oh God, you're so right." And I was like, but "You know, can I that, have it? that's part of the <laughs> goth girl thing that you never know when they're going to ask her feathers and bones." Honestly, right? But, Look, the other day she found a, just a giant feather. She was losing her mind, but. <laughs> <laughs> so I take it home. I'll just send you some of our chicken feathers. That'd be good. Well, she took the feet. That was none of my business. But like, <laughs> <laughs> so we Uh-oh, buried right. it in my yard. Um, so, and it's probably been like two, maybe three weeks now. So we're like, oh yeah, we gotta go. We gotta go get that. You know, clean it up, th- dig it this up. This is a lot more than I was expecting. Cause like. <laughs> Uh, b- before the show, you you showed me like uh, one of those uh, things you got from that uh, con a-, a while back. Yeah, it, it... yeah, yeah. Damn. So I actually got this from uh, a flea market, kind of like um, thrift. What are they called? Thrift store. No, not like a thrift store, but it was more like a like an outdoor indoor market type of like. Thing. You know what I mean? Where there's like a yeah. big building, a lot of sections. You would have loved it. There was a ton oh. of like old vintage video game stuff. Um, well, I- I'm very much anyway. the kind of guy that likes to dumpster dive through all kinds of uh, yeah. random stuff. Like I used to no, work at a thrift store, and that was like the best part. Like people would bring in all kinds of weird stuff. It was like, okay, well, what kind of treasures are we gonna find today? Yeah, yeah. So I was like, oh man, this would be a cool opportunity because I don't have any. Uh, you know, bones or anything to collect quite yet, um, in the moment at least. And I was like, oh, you know, maybe the bird skull will be my first one. But I was at this shopping district thing, and they had skulls in the, like a little oddity section, and they were fairly cheap. So you know, I went ahead and I got a fox skull. You know, um, really good quality, has all its teeth and everything for anyone who cares out there. Shit, man, I, I don't even have all of my teeth, and I'm alive. I know, right? <laughs> It's crazy. <laughs> well, before you get too deep off the rails later, <laughs> let's start the show. <laughs> direct that to the right place. Oh, looks like it's sick enough. Welcome to Dungeons and Talk Shows, the talk show that brings you monsters, news, and birds in the backyard. I am your host, Orion. And I am your host, Sam. I promise I'm not a serial killer. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it might be a slippery slope, but let's hope not. But My coworkers all think I'm a little weird, so like, it's fine. (laughs) It ain't easy being the resident goth boy, I suspect. Yeah. But uh, with us, we do have a uh, wonderful guest. <laughs> Hopefully you didn't scare him away, Sam. <laughs> Why don't you introduce yourself? Well, I first of all, I'd have to say this is one of the most unique starts to a show that I've been on. So I appreciate the, the experience. Uh, we'll leave it at that. But yes, my, my name is J.B. Hilliard. You can call me Joe. 
Uh, I am a uh, an epic and, and dark fantasy author, and I appreciate Ooh. the opportunity to come on the show and chat with you guys. Especially anything that has dungeons and something close to dragons in it, I'm I'm good. Yeah. So this is dungeons and foxes. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like, just it's awesome that you uh, do like dark fantasy stuff. Yeah. So uh, Sam true. is big on the dark fantasy. Our last campaign was a Grim Hollow themed uh, dark fantasy campaign. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's really that's I real didn't know cool. You were, uh, you were that's awesome. Seems yeah, very fitting me, I, now. <laughs> well, now I'll tell you. You know, it's funny because one of the um, one of the monsters in my uh, first series is a cursed uh, paladin. Basically, he's he's been turned into something that's this abomination, a cryptid called the Antlered Man, mm. and he has this. He has the body that's left the scarred remains of his 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 his. his carcass uh, but his head's been turned into this um lo looks almost like an elk rack it, you yeah. know if you were to look at an elk skull so the fact that we were talking about skulls from yeah, birds yeah, and yeah. foxes before we got on the air is kind of funny but uh you know and he's one of my favorite Ooh. villains i get a lot of feedback on him uh from from readers so i i, I love that that kind of angle uh i think really plays and it makes it a little different than just the standard dungeons and dragons and high fantasy stuff definitely feel that that's awesome yeah, for sure. I, I like the concept of that. And, like, uh, I would imagine it wouldn't even be too difficult to throw together a decent stat block to run something like that in a game. Because I, I firmly believe in, like, if you have a good set of uh, books or shows or something obscure that your uh, players aren't really too versed in, it's like, okay, I'm going to just uh, take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and surprise the players. Yeah, and it does kind of, uh, for anyone who's into, like, mythology and stuff, like, I, uh, it does kind of give a little bit of, like, the Wendigo vibe. You know, they have, like, the deer skulls. Yeah, and for me, the, I, I've taken a lot of my cryptids from mythology around the world. So the Antler Man was really sort of a mix between uh, a Nordic myth that was called mm -hmm. Master of the Hunt. Uh, and it was, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a, a man that had command over, you know, packs of wolves in you know, Norse mythology, and in this case, he doesn't have command over those. They, you know, animals kind of run away from him and have right. a fear of him. But it is, it's a mix of, like, the Native American window coupled mm. with this Nordic mix. I also do that with uh, skinwalkers. I take the idea uh, of yeah. the German doppelganger and mix it with the Native American skinwalkers, and I've created, a, a you know, a cryptid called the uh, Anthrobaxacari, which is my terminology for skin stealer. It's instead of it oh. being, uh, you know, like a, do a doppelganger that yeah. can just turn and like and morph. Uh, these things, when they attack you, they they you know they basically diffuse into your body and eat you from within, and then take your take your skin and and, and part of their digestive process, they do take over your memories, so they can mm. be you. Uh, but they're not the perfect version of you. Right. And this is a, a cryptid that's used by one of the big bad evil guys in, in the novels to kind of infiltrate uh, his his enemy. Uh, and so it's it's a yeah, pretty cool stuff. And I, and I, look, I do that because, you know, obviously, you know, in my realm, you want to do something unique and you want to build your mm. own world uh, as for that. And, and, you know, there's the standard dragons and the... Tolkien-esque orcs and Urukai that you can throw in there that people are familiar with, but you want to have something that you have ownership of. And so yeah. by creating these things, and I have this sort of deep, dark, gothic-y, Dracula-ish spin mm. to everything to make it scary, I think. And, and I also think it's fair that the good guys don't always win. Uh, and I think that makes it adultish and very um, interesting to those that may be outside of that, that high-end, young adult, mm -hmm. new adult kind of fantasy stuff. Yeah, I definitely get that. That oh, also absolutely. makes me think of like, um, you know, you have a lot of situations where DMs are very like reluctant to kill players and stuff like that. But I think for the sake of like the story and development and like teaching that like there are going to be sacrifices in this. You're not going to win every fight or, you know, you may win, but it may not feel like a win. Right. So it's yeah. like, I love that just kind of that. Yeah, the, the Pyrrhic victory you get from winning but losing at the same time, yeah. uh, I think, is something that's real. You, know, you never win a battle without losing somebody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my novels, no one's really safe. And right. I, I like that kind of Game of Thrones feel to it because uh, even your heroes 
often there is a better story to be had if they don't come home. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that that, even though you, you get criticized for it, I, I mean, look, I've been at all these cons and people are like, please don't kill this person. He's your Boba <laughs> Fett. Or please don't kill this person. And you're like, well, don't read beyond novel three. You know, like, <laughs> you know, you, 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 but, you know, it's, it's fun because, you know, ultimately that's what happens is casualties in war. And, you know, and this is a big battle, big war, even individual duels that you're looking forward to. Uh, you know, in the books, uh, mm -hmm. but you know, like I said, sometimes the, the bad guys win too, and I think that adds some level of realism right. into a ro world that's baked entirely in fantasy. So I, I think it keeps everybody grounded. Yes. Yeah, and it also keeps the stakes high. It's like, how can you not be yeah. invested in something if each character is like, okay, th their existence on this very page is but a fleeting moment, so I have to enjoy yeah. it while I can, because I don't know when that's going to be taken away. Right. Yeah, and I, I think that that's important too, in terms of you know, Jeopardy, is what authors call, you know, keeping keeping, you know, the reader in Jeopardy. Every chapter ends with something that keeps them on pins and needles, wants to keep them turning pages, wants them to buy the next mm -hmm. book, and it doesn't have to be cliffhanger endings all the time, it just has to be something that's so interesting, like you know, I just got criticized. One of my reviews uh, a couple of weeks ago when my fourth novel came out was, you know, he he didn't he didn't tell us what was coming in the next books. Well, of course I'm not. I want to leave you hanging <laughs> yeah. so you buy the next book. <laughs> what? But, you yeah, know, it's like it's one. okay. It's like you know, yeah, you know it's coming. You know what I mean? Because clearly I did an epilogue where you know that the story is still open ended, uh, but I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> you know, and you might have to wait six months, but too bad. You know, that's the way it goes. It, it's part uh, of the but, process. You know, it's like it's, yeah. yeah, right. You know, and it's a healthy thing where people are like, oh, I can't believe I don't know what's going to happen. Well, great. Buy the next one. You'll find out. Yeah. Right? And that's the business side of it, though. So but it's a lot of fun. I, yeah. I, I enjoy that. I, I really get an energy from book signings and or when I'm doing the right, you know, kind of interviews or if I'm at a con mm -hmm. and people come by and they're waiting for the next thing. Right. Like when's the next one come out or they've done, you know, like, uh, you know, fan art. You know, that stuff's humbling as hell, man. Like, oh, you literally, awesome. you, yeah, you don't expect this. Someone flew in, drove in, got a hotel room, paid to get wow. in to find you, to give you something. And a lot of these things are like, you know, police sketch art. You know, like, it's literally that good. <laughs> right. like, wow. Holy shit, that really looks like what I told you it was going to look like uh, in the books. And you're like, that's 80%, 90%. Some of them are even better than what I thought. I'm like, man, can I put this on my website? You know, when <laughs> yeah. I give them credit and stuff like that. And, but it's just it's it's just really humbling when, when you see people are that invested in, in mm -hmm. the stuff that you're writing and in the series. So... Yeah, just, you know, those little things keep people coming back. They might not want to admit it, but, you know, and they're upset at where, where stories end, but that's the whole point of it. I, yeah. you know, if it was boring at the end and everything was wrapped up, you would think was, I was done and, and that can't be the case. Yeah, you, you always got to leave yourself with some wiggle room. See, I feel like this is something that, like, especially in, like, recent shows and stuff like that, like a lot of anime, you know, um, you find that, like, you're getting like bored by the story, or at least I am, because the main character, you know, wins every fight. There's no like repercussions, you know what I mean? There's no consequences, really. They just get stronger, get more confident, you know, never lose. Then you get in the headspace of like, well, they'll never, you know, give this character like, you know, a loss or, you know, anything that's substantial so what are the states right like, <laughs> i absolutely that's right get that. yeah <laughs> it's like uh, i've been watching this uh, anime that's actually very uh, contrary to what you're saying sam because like uh, and i find it refreshing because of that it, it's called uh, kaiji and it, it's very mm -hmm. it's a gambling anime and like at the end of the first season i spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't watched it but like he gets his uh and, like almost all the fingers on his left hand chopped right off because of a bad gamble at the end. It's just like, mm. wow, what a way to end a season. The, the the man has suffered time and again and risked it all, won everything, mm -hmm. and then loses it all at the very end plus like his fingers. It's like, damn. Yeah. And I, I feel like this is something that, you know, talking about D D again, you know, DMs get in the headspace of like well, they want their players to be strong, be confident, feel like they're the heroes of the story, 
but at the same time, you don't want them to think they're, you know, safe or immortal, you know? Like, you don't necessarily have to kill them, but, like, definitely you should give them an L sometimes. <laughs> Oh, I, I yeah, it's a humbling agree. experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And like, you and it's okay a better to, ground to, to take an L. Like, yeah, so to, you, know, you losing NPCs is one thing, but losing a character every now and then, and or you know, because it's a fantasy world, there are always ways to bring yeah. them back. Right. I always, I'm always a fan of you know, like wounds and permanent scars and oh, absolutely, <laughs> losing uh, limbs and shit like that. <laughs> I, I'm especially a big fan of that. Like in the current campaign I'm running, y'all haven't had a chance to really lose any limbs due to bad decisions but like i have a whole bunch of prosthetics on standby for when somebody does that's awesome yeah and then you can get into like the fantasy like prosthetic idea oh man (laughs) yeah in fact i use that in my second novel there was a, a uh one of the warriors um Arjun Easy Kyle, he gets a cut, and and there's a there's a uh, poison on the blade of the enemy that mm. uh, that you know r- basically has a rapid gangrenous effect to his leg, and they have to to save him. They have to cut off his leg, and of course he's in a town of scholars and wizards, and so in the, in the downtime where you see him almost die, and the time you come back, they've attached this prosthetic that over time will get better and in the beginning he limps he's he's it's hard for him to ride a horse he can't fight the way he used to but right. the, as the limb takes hold and the magic seeps in uh it actually becomes uh you know an asset for him right. because he'll be able to kick down doors and kick through stone and things that he doesn't even know he can do yet because right. uh, he re- really hasn't learned to use the magic but mm. that that's what i mean about the realism that that you find in dark fantasy sometimes right. and it's not always how you want to end it, but your idea of scarring and taking an L, man, that's 100% true, and it's, it's, it makes for a better story. And whether it's mm-hmm. D&D, uh, whether it's a video game, right. or you know, Absolutely. whether it's you know, in, in you know, novels or a movie, it just, it just, I think it makes for a better ending in some cases. Mm-hmm. No, definitely. I, I would have to agree. And, like, really, there's something to be said for the, uh, the so-called French ending to... Uh, anything like whether it be just a chapter in a story or the uh, grand finale a no. fine example of that is uh, there's this uh, french uh, uh animation like it called uh, last man uh, i had watched it years ago and what really uh, stuck with me after watching uh, this whole show is that at the very end there was the the main dude just kind of lost. He he managed he managed to live through everything. Like this big, uh, amazing uh, climax happens, but like the bad guy won. He lost. Nothing. It, the resolution was just very strange, but it worked because like the problems that he had been dealing with are are now gone. He's able to go right. about living his normal life. All the while, like. It, it wasn't a win by any means. Right. Also, that... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, please, please. <laughs> uh, I was also going to say, you know, another way to kind of like push those like narratives is, you know, the amount of like emotional, you know, what's the word? Uh, investment? Yeah. You know, the emotional investment and... You know, the situations and the growth that can come from it, I think, can be really good for, like, the story case, you know? So, like, I like, now that the problems are gone, you know, you have the moral implication of, like, I did what I had to do, you know, to get here. And then it's like, am I really satisfied, right? Or am yeah. I, you know, is everything really solved? Or are these problems just gone? Yeah. I mean, like, well, ultimately, if something is resolved whether or not it's how you want it to be like sometimes that's just it's enough to push things forward mm-hmm. yeah and in a good book too or a good movie or a good tv show uh half wins are okay they make and what i mean yeah. by that is people are used to struggle in yeah. everyday life sometimes it's to pay the bills sometimes it's a health thing sometimes it's a relationship mm-hmm. thing sometimes it's all the above and you know you it's not always perfect. It doesn't come out storybookish, right? Mm-hmm. And so, 
when you're writing in fantasy, you've got high fantasy and classical fantasy mm -hmm. and sword and sorcery and epic fantasy, but dark fantasy allows you to get away with some of those things that make it a little bit more believable yeah. because it doesn't come out. And in the same way, I mean, I, I mentioned Game of Thrones fleetingly mm -hmm. earlier, but great I think that's a good example of that, yeah. right? Where you, you know, you have heroes in there that sometimes become anti-heroes or heroes mm -hmm. in there that die and it's like, what happens next? Or you start to see the, the and, and this is my favorite, it's like the Darth Vader effect, right? Yeah. Where it's like, you've got this big bad villain and he's not born or she's not born evil, like something happened. And right. then when you learn their backstory, you're like, oh, well, I see how they got down this path. Oh, you know, and, and it might be something I would have chosen. Like I might've gone down the same path. So now they're yeah. more identifiable and now you're cheering on a redemption arc, which you don't even know is happening. Right. And do they choose the arc of redemption or they choose to, you know, to keep, you know, in this case, like the dark side mm -hmm. staying on that way. And I think that keeps people turning pages and, and continuing to binge shows because mm -hmm. you want to find out, you, you know what you would do. You want to find out what they're going to do. Right. Yeah. And, and as long as it's believable in that sense, the fantasy world around them, they can now believe they can suspend this belief to put themselves in there because it's familiar to them. And they see that it's like, Oh, okay, well, this guy has a physical ailment or this person has a mental problem or, or there's a, you know, the societal issue that's pressing them. I feel that too. And I can identify with that. I'm just seeing it through the eyes of a fantasy or mm -hmm. sci-fi or a dystopian character. And, and I think that helps mm -hmm. kind of wrap that around and, and make it much more believable. No, absolutely. I think the best yeah. kind of villain and that didn't even really have to necessarily be a villain, you know. But I think the best kind of character is one that is relatable and understandable. And, yeah. like, you know, that does so much for, like, damn, you're not, you know, you're not evil. You're just, you've just been through it. Man. Like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's kind of what worked real well in uh, the uh, late 90s when the, uh, when the Batman animated series was uh, working mm -hmm. with Dr. Freeze because like uh, the whole yeah, concept absolutely. of like uh, this example. dude's got this his wife uh, uh, was is like incurable disease he's got to put her on ice he's wronged by the company that he was working for and now he's got like this whole uh, condition going on it's just like th this guy's been through it and that's relatable in the sense that we've all kind of been there with the world and yeah. everything just kind of screwing you over and you kind of like you all kind of become the byproduct of your situation yeah sometimes. absolutely it's kind of like the you know you mentioned batman and suffer you know the whole gotham thing right they live in this like crime riddled city you know the only way to really make money is working for you know these fucking like crime lords and then you got Batman coming in and breaking your legs. You're just trying to pay your rent. Like, <laughs> honestly, that's my biggest gripe with any movie I watch <laughs> nowadays. Because like, my my wife will be just watching uh, some uh, show or whatever. I'll walk in, and I'll just see all these these poor dudes just doing their job, being like a grunt in some way, <laughs> just like a just like. For for fuck's sake, main characters, stop killing the guards. <laughs> they have families to go well, home. They gotta kill to. somebody, right? It doesn't work yeah, it's, there, like the, it's like the red shirt guys in Star Trek. You know they're all going down, but like you have to, you know, Jensen or whoever, like, you know, man, it's gonna live for like two minutes because you've got to make an example. It, it it puts you back into that term I call before Jeopardy, which is yeah. you know someone can die at any time, and and I love the idea of the Batman because so, of course. I like Batman the best because it was dark, even when it wasn't, when it was still pow and wapo and all that kind of stuff, you know, from a comic book perspective, it was darker than the rest. And I think what DC has done and DC has many flaws in their movies, trust mm. me. Uh, but like ultimately the dark Knight, when it came out in the comics in the late eighties, early nineties, and you saw an older Batman and the first Robin had was killed and the second Robin they introduced as a girl and she was run over by the tires of a plane and like like stuff was going bad and you're like holy cow this is more of an adult version this was like the first graphic novels that you were yeah. you were growing graphic. up to doing and then you look at the joker movies and you look at the penguin series and but they're all gritty and they feel mm -hmm. real and then all of a sudden well you can kind of identify with phoenix uh you know oh, yeah. um yeah joaquin phoenix in the joker you're like 
yeah, the guy's crazy, but I can identify with him. Or mm -hmm. the, you most recently, the Colin Farrell version of the Penguin on HBO. I mean, it's like you feel bad for the guy, and yeah. all of a sudden you can identify with him. But in the classic Batman, you're only seeing it through the goggles of Batman and the optics right. of Batman, which of course has his own darkness, which I think is really cool. You know, it's like you, yeah. you're, you're like he's a willing, mm -hmm. he's a willing superhero that's that's going to go out there and kill somebody, right? Because he's a vigilante, <laughs> right. as opposed to some of the others, which you know, Superman with his hands on his hips and X-ray mm -hmm. vision and unbeatable in many respects. I always liked the Batman stuff because he could die at any minute, right? And I think that that, that Jeopardy really kind of ties it up and the fact that he does kill some guards is, <laughs> you know, even though those poor bastards aren't making any money and they're doing it for, you know, at the end of the day there's they're, they're crooked and you don't yeah. mind when crooked people take it. So, like, it's just yeah. it's what it is. No, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, Alright, Sam, well, what do you got for the monster this week? Yeah, alright, um... Let's oh see. wait, I I I did this Sam just before the yeah, show. Yeah. Unveiling the darkest secrets of the creature <laughs> of the week. Sam's monster lore. It fades out on its own now. Nice. Much better. Yeah. That's I, pretty good, guys. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. So this week, um, I was kind of looking through, you know, the notes that we've been doing and the stuff we've been talking about, and I thought I would dip back into the dragon space a little bit with one or more of the obscure boys. <laughs> you know, this is something I didn't really know about either, so I was kind of surprised. And I, was like, oh, I do cool. like obscure stuff because, like, you'll just like go on a research binge and dig um, up some monster I've never heard of, and it's like, Sam, what the fuck is this? <laughs> I know, right? And then, you know, my hope is always, you know, you start to see more, you know, strange things that you don't normally see in your games or, you know, stuff like that. Mm. Kind of, uh, I like to give people some some more options, some more ideas. And that's what we do here, right? <laughs> yes, we, we fill everyone's uh, DM with ideas <laughs> that will just uh, make their players suffer. So uh, just for a quick recap of what we like to do here, JV, uh, I talk about a monster. I go over the ecology and the lore. Uh, I talk about like the you know, forbidden realms and sometimes not forbidden, sorry, forgotten realms. And sometimes the <laughs> real realms. world, you know, myth, <laughs> real world myth and folklore, if there is any. And then we go into uh, an IRO fight score to see how you feel like you would stack up against you know whatever creature I have described. For <laughs> Usually okay. it's a no. <laughs> Usually, yeah, yeah, as you could expect. <laughs> Sometimes it's fun. So this time I bring the dragon or lion drinks. So dragons largely resemble giant lions with the brassy scale covering and being a smaller version of the wings of brass dragons. Their faces, which were perched on a long neck and inserted above Encircled by a particularly thick and coarse mane, featured large feathery eyebrows and big, usually brass-colored eyes. So, so yeah, you can kind of picture a smaller brass dragon with kind of the lion aesthetic with a long neck. And, you know, stuff that's, like that. that's just like it's like mixing a lizard with a with a giraffe and a lion. <laughs> yeah, honestly, in, in my the neck mind. is really interesting. <laughs> I'm just kind of surprised with that. Yeah, I'm just kind and of you know, I've talked about lion. drakes before, and I feel like drakes are usually my favorite type of draconic creatures. So this is really interesting. <laughs> um, so dragons typically reach a length of about 12 feet, 3.7 meters, and measured about 5 feet, 1.5 meters at the shoulders. Though especially long-lived individuals were known to reach lengths of 18 feet, 5.5 meters, tails excluded, and shoulder heights of 8 feet, 2.4 meters, uh, a typical dragon weighed about 700 pounds or 320 kilograms. Uh, I'm picturing this thing to be about the size of a Honda Civic. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Some pounds. Yeah. Something that is... I mean, I don't know. yeah, probably like a like a medium-sized car or something. Yeah, like that. yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Like medium-sized car-ish. 
So typically, dracons preyed on meek herd animals like goats, antelopes, or camels. Only in times of famine would they prey on humanoids, despite their reputation for hunting helpless travelers. The Bedin, which is a uh, race of kind of like tribal war-like people, had adopted a tactic to prevent dragons from attacking domesticated animals, namely by covering them with used clothing in order to give them the odor of people. Dracones were known to serve Nobanian, and they were counted among the power's favored monsters. I believe I mean, Nobanian was It's got a lion's up. head. That's pretty favorable. Yeah, I mean, imagine, like, the the aura of, like, a king, and, like, you walk into the chambers, and he has, like, a dragon sitting next to him. <laughs> like, this shit would be crazy. So a commonly held view was that dragons originated in magical experiments conducted by ancient wizards, which is fairly um, common among the Drake theme. Uh, they're not usually like a natural creature uh, who intended to create powerful mounts and guardians in the name of their lord by modifying lions with the essence of brass dragons. Another written about by Ibn al-Arif in his guidebook, Anorak, was that the creatures were a result of magical crossbreeding, which makes sense, you know. Yeah. So in the Forgotten Realms, among those with the capability to keep them, dragons were popular animal companions with moon elves. Likewise, noble jinn were known to keep dragons as servants and companions. The wizard's spell Find Minion could also bring forth a dragon minion and would give the spellcaster long feathery eyebrows reminiscent of those of the creature in this event. Fine minion, is that like a 3-5 thing? I think it's 4-E. Because that sounds way better than what we got going on in 5th edition right now. Let me see. I'm just saying. Oh, I think it's 2nd edition, actually. Damn, bring back fine minion. Yeah, I mean, we have all these other summon spells, why not? So the short-lived dwarven city, Air Calvary of Calamos Var rode, oh Calamos Var, rode on the backs of dragoons. Zentarum sky mages and Averil sky wardens also sometimes use dragons as mounts. Interesting so, enough. I'm just, uh, wait, yeah. you're, you're telling me that dwarves ride mm. little uh, dragons with with the <laughs> with lion heads in, into yep. a fight? Yep. Oh. oh. I can see it. That shit fucks. <laughs> uh, that, that would really change some Lord of the Rings. Just throw Gimli you know, I, on a little lion-headed dragon. You know, it definitely <laughs> makes sense because, like, with lions being, like, prideful, you know, and dwarves are super prideful. So, like, Listen, it makes sense. Th you will never find better craftsmanship than the saddle a dwarf would make for one of these things. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Honestly, that was one of my favorite uh, aspects of the uh, the Nordic uh, stuff that the uh, uh, Rick Riordan, the writer of the uh, Percy Jackson series, mm -hmm. he uh, did this whole thing where dwarves have uh, like in their society naturally like they're all, almost always like craftsmen and stuff. Right. But in theirs, uh, they have this whole like uh, they instead of dueling traditionally, they just have crafting duels. Oh, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> And it's like it's a like whole a spectacle. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like a, it's like one of those uh, shows where there's like, oh hey, uh, like like forged forged and fire. And, yeah, it's like forged <laughs> and fire. Yeah, with a little yeah, extra magic. <laughs> We're like, welcome to this year's forged and fire event. The forged dwarves here are cast to craft. I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Forge and Fire is the most dwarven show, show I can is think of. Goated. Oh my god. Dude, what when my dad told me that he started watching that show, I was so I was like, oh, let's go. <laughs> Honestly, Forge and Fire is at its best when you're like sitting with somebody else and watching it and you're like, yo, this guy right here, he's got it. He's I'm got like, it. I could make this. <laughs> yeah. It's fun like that. So interesting enough, uh Dracones were kind of like widely hunted by barbarians. Because, uh, you know, you can imagine that their pelts are very useful, as well as being worth about 2,000 gold pieces each. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, just to yeah. uh, put that it's in the bag. Brass, brass drake pelt, man, basically. 
Kuan's Collectible Creatures, a monster shop that catered to wizards looking for components for magical experimentation, also were known to stock dragons. So you could, you know, if you have uh, DMs out there looking to add a shop with some interesting wares, there you go. That's an option for you. Okay, Sam. Yeah. You, you know how a while back I, I came up with a rough calculation for how much one gold is worth? Yeah, like into USD, I remember. It, yeah, yeah. So you're, you're telling me that the pelts of these things are worth between thirty to $40,000. I mean... <laughs> no wonder they're being hunted. <laughs> Let's be real. These things are not that strong, okay? Like... <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It makes sense. The size of like a car—that's a—that's a whole lot of pelt. Yeah, true. Yeah. And imagine like the, the buffs you could probably get from it. Pretty, pretty, pretty decent. I don't know. Just uh, you know, you could just uh, kill one of these things, uh, reupholster your car. Yeah, truly. You would have the sickest like leather chair. It'd be amazing. So getting made into dad the... chairs, that's what I need. Ooh, <laughs> the throne would be fire. <laughs> I think a dwarf could make a, a real good lazy boy. That's what I'm saying. Oh, man. So getting into the abilities and stats here. Unlike their fully draconic relatives, they only had a limited ability to fly, capable of staying airborne for up to half an hour. Okay, so the like role... more of a glider type thing. Right, yeah, very short distance. Uh, but I'm pretty sure they do lack the flyby because of that. You know? Yeah, so they're that, not, that makes they're sense. Not they're like Spyro. Yeah. I could see, like, they, they buy these mostly now, and if they have to jump any, like, hills or cliffs or anything. Yeah. Like a flying squirrel. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Rocky and Bullwinkle. <laughs> I don't know why so, that made me think of this, but could you imagine <laughs> just being a druid that weaponizes sugar gliders? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> that would be hilarious. Just have like a bunch of these little flying squirrels in like these thick sleeves. Can you apply like primal savagery to a creature? <laughs> you know what? That's a great idea. I'll allow it. <laughs> it a, uh, a spell like uh, I just like the oh, concept I of a druid just evolved. throwing these little flying squirrels at people. That would be hilarious. Your summons are just squirrels. Like, you're basically Squirrel Girl. <laughs> Listen, dude, Squirrel Girl is a very underappreciated <laughs> hero in the Marvelverse. <laughs> Mostly because, like, I, well, squirrel powers look weird, but, like, uh, it, she, she's got some thick hips, uh, you know. <laughs> the power of the thickness, man. <laughs> So the role of a dragoon was its greatest weapon, as you can imagine with it being blind. Those who heard this creature's roar found their minds and body weakened, leaving them vulnerable to the attacks. So getting into the stats here, we have a strength of 19, dexterity of 15, constitution of 17, intelligence of 6, wisdom of 12, and a charisma of 12. Okay, okay. So not super smart, you know. You know. No, actually, like as, as far as a uh, animal is concerned, that's very smart. This thing's twice as smart as a dog. I mean, yeah, true. That's I don't terrifying. know if it has the ability to speak. Maybe limited. Mm. I mean, I, I imagine they at least spoke draconian or draconic. Well, but, that that is enough to be able to speak. But I'm just thinking, yeah, like, this is a predator. That's twice as smart as a that dog. Like, I'm, I'm already like, no, <laughs> I don't yeah. want to fuck with that. <laughs> so we have the multi-attack, as you can imagine. Lion Drake makes one bite attack and two claw attacks. And then we have the bite attack. It's pretty regular. Uh, if a target is medium or smaller, it must save on a DC 15 strength save or be not prone. Uh, claw is pretty basic. And then we have the blood chilling roar. The Lion Drake lets out a terrifying roar, audible out to 300 feet. Any creature within 30 feet of the Lion Drake that can hear must succeed on a DC 14 wisdom saving throw or be frightened for one minute. Yeah. A creature that fails to save by five or more is also paralyzed for the same duration. A creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of its turns, ending the effect on success. Uh, if a target is successful, ends the effect and is also immune for the next 24 hours. All right. 
So, I mean, a DC 14 wisdom save isn't that crazy. At the same time, like, a, just Everyone's mighty here. roar and everything's <laughs> paralyzed. Like, that, that's yeah. devastating. It's, it's enough for him to hit multiple people with it and with it maybe being paralyzed. It's kind of mm. crazy. Yeah, that's something I would stay away from if I saw it in real life. Yeah, like, in the <laughs> game? You know, that's the kind of creature you want to roll as your, like, special familiar. Yeah. Those things would be badass, right? You know, really I, I better. Can you can upgrade. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you, and, and you get that, in, or the, you have to earn it in some way. You help, I don't know, yeah. the den of them, if that's what they're called. Yeah, maybe you're, like, rewarded like an egg or something, you know. It, yeah, it's yeah, a good be. alternative for the uh, find steed spell because, like, a, in a previous Ooh. campaign that I ran, I allowed one of the players to use find steed to summon a uh, bat-like creature, and Ooh. that worked yeah. out well because there was so much flying in the party that what one flying mount was not going to make a difference, especially seeing right. as the character that wanted it had already had the ability to fly. So it's like nothing's being broken here. Fine. You can have it. Right. It's aesthetics at this point. Yeah, I feel that. Yeah, it adds character to the group. Mm, for sure. Yeah, that's that's pretty much it. They are, you know, they're not super deep creatures. Um, I think they're interesting, though. They seem kind of cool. I would say that uh, if, if I had to fight one of these things, <laughs> I'm going to give that a seven. Because, uh, like... I definitely don't want to fight something like that, but it doesn't seem like it. Sense. It doesn't seem like you can't win at all. Like you just have to be yeah. smart in prep time. Yeah, honestly, I mean, Constitution is good as you can expect with it being you know brass dragon related. Strength is strong, but I feel like you know you can keep your distance relatively well. Yeah, I mean, like a... it's flying isn't that great. It's one of those things where you'd have to be tricky. Yeah, you'd have to definitely like play the cards right. I <laughs> feel. Oh, yeah, that's uh, about all I have uh, for that. What do you think, Sam? What, what would you give this? Like, uh, how, how would you try to fight it? Uh, okay, so yeah, I probably wouldn't stand a chance. This we were, I'd get like a nine. <laughs> like, <laughs> I would probably my my bet would probably be to like mount it in some way. You know, and then, like you get you know pretty high on the neck, and then it's like, what is it gonna do, right? Roll over. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it'll probably like fly for a little bit, and then what, like fall on its back? I don't know. Like you know what I mean? <laughs> like if that's the case, then so be it. That's probably my tactic. <laughs> you know, what? That, that's a fair assessment. The... I mean, like it's it is yeah. mountable, so yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. I feel like that would probably be the only chance uh, outside of somehow keeping a distance and maybe, I don't know. Yeah, the the best way there is going to be distance weapons. You're going to get mm. missiles and or magic. You can hit with a claw attack, to... you get knocked prone, you're cooked. Like... Yeah, yeah, you're done. <laughs> yeah, because contextually, that roar reaches out to an entire football field in length. Three hundred. Yeah, feet. you're at least hearing it. So it's just like, yeah. damn. You Plus have the three... fact, if you throw yourself into the reality of the fact that this creature is there and it roared and knows it's, it's coming after you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's that's an easy one where you can run away, like Monty Python, run away. <laughs> you know, I... Yeah. You know, nothing like uh, the the family uh, time honored secret technique of run like a bitch. <laughs> but man, yeah. think about the glory you would get from bringing one of these down. Oh, that's the masculine dream. <laughs> it is. That's why, that's why barbarians are hunting these things. Like, yeah, really, I, what you gotta do is notoriety, dude. Yeah, yeah, dude. If you can manage that much. You're good to go. Uh, I I think that if you're able to slice uh, through the neck, you're 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 basically set. But oh, the damage that would do to a blade. Dude, yeah, I'm, like I, I can see. You know, say your party like meets a tribe of barbarians, right? You go to speak with the chief. They got like the the heads of like their you know their hunts mounted on the wall. You see one you don't like recognize. You're like it looks kind of like a lion, and they're like. 
That's no mere lion, all right? You think I'm some bitch? All right, I just go hunt a lion? <laughs> Any six-year-old can hunt a lion. <laughs> it takes a man to hunt this. <laughs> like, let me tell you the tale how the roar could be heard from hundreds of feet away. You know what I mean? Mm. I feel like that'd be really cool. Yeah, I like that. Uh, Joe, if would you ever consider using a uh, creature like this in uh, one of your stories? Uh, yeah. You know, first of all, it's rare. You know, mm. people will identify with because you'll see it's like half. And I've I've used manticores mm. in my story, and, the, and 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 their background is very similar. Where folks, you know, if you read the ecology of them, they're mm. thought of as being created in labs, almost Frankenstein together, yeah. right? Yeah. And and these things are a little different, sort of like a sphinx. Instead of having a human head, um, you know, these things have a lion's head, and so some manticore mm-hmm. have human heads, some manticore have dragon heads. Right. Some manticore are seen and have lion heads, so it's very similar. So I have, I have employed them because they're terrifying, right? Like oh, those, absolutely. these kind of things coming at you with a roar, and you know this like flying squirrel thing, and you know you don't want to eat by a lion head, you know, and stuff. And it, it, if it looks like a brass dragon, you, I'm gonna run, yeah, right? Yeah. Like that's not, yeah, that's not good. You see the um, gleam, but they're also like, oh fuck. <laughs> yeah yeah and it's like so it's like mini stuff so it just it depends i think that it might be too regal to yeah. fit into some of my stories that. although I, I i honestly you know i like the concept of it and it's yeah. one of those when i saw it on the you know, roster of things to talk about it's one of those D D creatures that i've never fought mm. and i've been playing D <laughs> almost since i was 10 you know and so i've gone through monster manual one through the newest version of them and even though you see them, you know, because, you know, like, it's almost like a chimera or a yeah. hydra. Right. Like, you know, they're there, but you know what? Fuck it. Just put in a dragon, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> if you're going to go that far, make it a dragon. Because uh, like my, like my, my, my reach for these, you know, I want to give alternatives. You don't always want to use, you know, the same same old same old you know spice it yep. up a little bit. <laughs> uh, i can see yeah. a lot of utility in this against uh your typical metagame uh player because like oh the, it, it looks like a brass dragon they start flipping through their monster manual trying to metagame their way through something and you're just like ah but it has a lion's head <laughs> yeah <laughs> just complete you meltdown like what? excuse me I, yeah. I mean, like that's not gonna happen. That's kind of how I feel about like manticores too, because like as soon as you hear, you know, say an NPC is like, "Oh, we've seen a manticore in the area," your brain is like, "Oh, okay, lion, dragon, snake boy, right?" But you know, it could be anything. Yeah, you know? mm. it could have almost the powers of you know whatever creatures you give it, right? I do that's like, like, I like, you can I like do the so idea much with... of like uh, maybe the local villager tells you that it's a manticore because like some people have seen uh, little bits uh-huh. of it and it's just like, okay that lines up but then you get there and it's like no that that's not it at all You're like, wait a minute this one's weird like what what the heck <laughs> why does it have a squirrel head like what, what's going on <laughs> <laughs> the squirrel dragons everywhere <laughs> Sons of bitches. Yep. <laughs> right. oh, do you have any news for this week? Uh, let's see. I do. I do. This is TNF bringing you nerd news. So, uh, as both of you probably know, D&D has recently started celebrating its 50th anniversary. Hell yeah, they're old. 50 years of nerds gathering together, uh, you know, playing pretend with your best friends and rolling dice with your Mountain Dew and Doritos. The best of the best. And how else would Wizards of the Coast decide to celebrate this than releasing a vinyl album? (laughs) Yeah, that... Yeah, that that, that that look on your face, Sam. That, that's where I'm at. <laughs> like, excuse me. <laughs> yeah, they uh, decided to release this uh, v- for one vinyl. Like, okay, so that's this is only directed at people who have a record player or fifty dollars to drop on a on a record. 
Because unless they find one, you know, in like a thrift shop or something. Like I got one in my garage. That's not a problem. But dude, fifty bucks for an album—that that's a lot. And what, so, what is it like? Who made the music? Like, <laughs> uh, let me look here. Like, a, they had one of the uh, artists for the for some of their Magic the Gathering uh, stuff do the okay, cover for sense. the uh, well, for the for the vinyl sleeve. So you got some nice art for that. That's cool. It, it's let's see, unexpected instruments, otherworldly textures, and spellbinding forty-person choir. Okay. Headed by the movie and TV composer Michael Gatt. Okay, that that's the guy that did music for Kite Man, Hell Yeah, and Blood Drive. Okay. Okay, that I don't know. It just seems like a very odd choice. But at the same time, I kind of get it because like, uh, Baldur's Gate Three did extremely well with their soundtrack. True, so, I've heard a lot of good things about it. Yeah, like, I really enjoy the Baldur's Gate 3 uh, soundtrack, so maybe that's what they're going for. But I do think that that's uh, 50 bucks for the album's kind of a steep price. Hmm. I mean, it is going to be, like, a niche thing, you know? And I, I imagine it'll be mostly for, like, those collectors or those rare, you know, people out there. Who are gonna yeah, that's going to be a hard pass for me. I, that's yeah. just not my... I, I, to be all, in all honesty, I, if someone gifted it to me and I got it like as a grif, like a Christmas present or something, it's oh, a cool yeah. thing to put on yeah. your bookshelf. Yeah, but yeah, like, I put it on my wall or something, you know. Yeah, something like that looks kind of cool, but you know, this is maybe one of these other things where Wizards of the Coast just missed the mark again. Yeah, you know? like, yeah. what? It's There's so many yeah, I, other ways you could have approached this. I feel like. Yeah, I mean, the game. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about a 50th anniversary, the game was built around books and dice. Right. right and imagination yeah. and has nothing to do with with an album now, i don't mind look there's all like i, yeah, I if you're gonna go out and get a composer for it i would have gotten bear mccreary i mean the guy mm. kicks but i mean that his his stuff for you know gods of ragnarok or the theme yeah. for black uh black uh black sales or you know his stuff for the 300 movies i mean the dude's just really good at this fantasy sci-fi oh, stuff, right? He does video games, he does movies, he does... I was like, I mean, that's the guy you want to get. But ultimately, like the vinyl, I get it. It's a throwback to the 70s mm -hmm. when the game was created, I guess, and, and like the idea yeah. behind it. It just is one of those things, it's, it's impractical. Yeah. Yeah. And on top know. of that, like, yeah. don't get me wrong, I love puns, but th they decided to call it spell jams and kind of give this whole spell jammer aesthetic. But like, congratulations, you've gone and restricted it even further by the the number of modern <laughs> players who play spell jammer. So yeah, yeah. It, it's yeah, and it was kind of a failed system. I mean, spell jammer was not one of the more popular ideas. Yeah. Yeah, like it's it, it weird, is, but the execution of modern spell jammer was flopped. Like, right. I yeah. I love right. the concept of spell jammer, but like, they didn't put enough into it, and a lot of people complained about that. They're like, hey, how do we run ship combat? Mm -hmm. And then it's just like, well, you, you here you just do a couple things, and no, no, there's 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 more robust ways to do that, and people tend to want more robust ways to do that. Like. Don't get me wrong, like, one of the best things I love about 5th edition is, okay, I'm just gonna take the fact that it's a gutted framework and slip something else in there, because that's how I do things. That bastard's D&D is the only way I run D&D, but uh, <laughs> not everyone is me, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yep. I, I will say, though, to their credit, I like the concept of, like, uh, you have your friends over... And you have yeah. like, maybe you have like a record player slash CD slash radio, like a little multi purpose thing, and you yeah. just kind of slap them. a yeah, vinyl on them. there. Cause, and this is something that you could find for like 10 bucks at a yard sale. So that's not bad. And, and then you yeah, just like, I okay, could also put it on there, set the tone. And th that that's cool. That That's fine. You know, set the tone for the night. But, but who's no, doing that? <laughs> yeah, like, it, it's neat, but like you could do the same thing with the Spotify playlist. 
Yeah, from people who used like YouTube as background music for like their D and D games and stuff, right? Like... My wife uses <laughs> yeah, uh, fantasy the concept ba- of it. Sure, <laughs> my wife uses fantasy background music for sleeping. <laughs> so so it's it just seems like... kind of like odd to yeah. me that you would celebrate such a big, you know, achievement with such a niche, you know. Yeah, like, I mean, they've done uh, other things for their fiftieth anniversary, but this just seems. It's a little weird, right? <laughs> little, I have to wonder what's going on at the with the higher ups at uh, Watsi because they're just like they keep throwing out weird stuff that's so far off. I, out of touch. <laughs> I, at time and again, I find myself asking, "Who who asked?" <laughs> real. <laughs> <laughs> so real. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, though, with uh, more of the D and D news, their new player's handbook has become one of the fastest-selling D and D products of all time. Apparently, that's great. Which, uh, despite all of the, uh, de- like, our podcast started around uh, the dawn of the OGL debacle. So the fact that this is selling as good as it has is really just a testament to the fact that bad PR is still PR all the same. True. Yeah, people are kind of going to, you know, buy the product at least for themselves before they really, which I think is always good, right? I think it just kind of goes to show that tons of people are just trying to get back into D&D, and since there's been such fanfare for D and D in general over the past few years, yeah, it's just like absolutely. it's been kind of echoed out into the the public consciousness, whether or not people had even really thought too much about it. Like the average consumer isn't really thinking too much about what uh, Watsi is doing behind the scenes. They're just like, right. oh hey, D and D, I used to play that back in two thousand four. I'd mm-hmm. love to get the crew yeah, back together. You definitely know? now, you know. D&D just in general has become such a big, like, you know, existence in, like, media and people in general. Like, this is the most I've ever heard people talk about D&D, you know, outside of the clubs in school or, like, the few friends you had. You know what I mean? It, it's like, crazy. <laughs> like, uh, the charter school that my kids go to, they're, my daughter signed up for an elective where they play D&D. And, awesome. uh, now she's like, Dad, I, I need my character sheet for Fuzzly. <laughs> Dude, I feel Fuzzly. like, you know, we've <laughs> talked about, you know, the good things that D&D can do for, like, emotional development, you know, and, like, mm. you know, stuff like that. I feel like kids, especially, like, I feel like that's such a good way for them to express themselves and, like, to, to agree, work through cause... situations they may not understand in real life. It's something that goes far beyond that, because... Uh, at a societal level, uh, public education is failing uh, on mass, where kids True. are struggling with reading and they're struggling with math, and they're struggling with critical thinking and problem solving. And yeah. a good DM can basically get a player into doing. You can trick your players into being educated. <laughs> <So> flat <true. laughs> I mean, y- y- math is very essential, and. You're playing a game, but you're also, you know, experiencing like real life ish scenarios. And, you know, how many times were you in like a math class or something and they're talking about someone buying apples? Like, who's doing that? But now you want to bring in, <laughs> you want to earn money from this quest, fight a dragon? That's a little more interesting than buying some soap bottles. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it's like tricking them into. <laughs> oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, no, no. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just say it's just it, that's exactly what you're just tricking him into learning, you know, and yeah. also experiencing things they're not really experiencing. But yeah. you you see that all over the place. I, we did that. I you know in the political realm, uh, you, where you, you you gameplay something so that you know what someone's going to say in a debate or what someone's mm-hmm. going to say on TV or mm. how things. What what do you do in this scenario? We use it in defense. Uh, you know, defense department uses it. Uh, for war games and stuff like that where things are not happening so it's it's a way to react to something so when you get there it's on unfa- it's not unfamiliar to you anymore and mm-hmm. so D, i know i started playing D when i was 10 so like for me you know i 
was doing things and pretending that I was doing things and learning from other reactions that I would get from other players or the DM uh, that would put you in those scenarios. And I thought that was always helpful for, for me. And I'm sure helpful for a lot of, a lot of kids that might be introverted. And this is a way for them yeah, to at least experience something, yeah. you know, even though it's fake. Absolutely. Cause like uh, my father had been using this for my brother Milo as a way to kind of get like he was terrible with math terrible with reading couldn't do any of that stuff well in any capacity and it's just like okay what are you going to do so he kind of goes back to one of the things that he knows well D D. and over the past couple years it's helped him a lot it, it's helped him with uh coming out of his shell and and he's feeling just fine <laughs> it, it's helped him with coming out of his shell and being more willing to try new things reading the mm -hmm. stuff that's necessary doing the math involved and then on top of that problem solving his way through things and if he decides to do something uh, morally or ethically wrong or wants to explore the, the consequences of something it's a controlled environment where there are consequences, but it doesn't affect you for the rest of your life. Real. And, like, giving uh, kids a, a space to make mistakes, I feel, is one of the best ways to get people to learn. Because you don't get experience without doing. No, absolutely. So I, I've always kind of kind of wondered, especially with you being you know, father of so many kids who play d, &D. Mm. I, I'm curious if you experience this. Um, teaching, like, lessons to kids is mm. really hard in a lot of ways, right? So I imagine having, like, situations that they understand and have them, you know, play it through a character can give them a lot of, like, oh, that does make sense. And now I understand why, you know, this situation is bad or, you know... Uh, to working through that, you know, that critical thinking and those problem solving things that they don't get from school, right? Or they don't get from yeah. just like doing other things. I feel like they could learn so much. So, like, is that something that like you can kind of see in your kids? Uh, I I do, but at the same time, it's it's difficult because yeah, uh, the biggest struggle I have, and many other parents in this, I, maybe it's a struggle that parents have always had. Or maybe it's just a modern struggle of modern parenting. But mm -hmm. I find that getting kids to want to try, regardless yeah. of what the subject matter is, like the willingness to try has been consistently an issue, at least in my experience. And I'm trying to use it as a way to incentivize the kids to want to try something. <laughs> It's tricky, for sure, but uh, I've managed to get the kids to at least uh, mess around with it a little bit, uh, right. although they get more focused on the dice themselves, because, uh, <laughs> right, right. like, uh, as you know, most of my kids are under the age of 10, so uh -huh. you're trying to get uh, kids to sit down, not kill each other, while there's little clickety-clackities to throw around the room. <laughs> true, true. Most of the time, you're just, like, sitting at a table, like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, I can it, imagine the ADHD probably goes crazy, uh, especially with my <laughs> oldest. <laughs> All right, we we do have uh, you, know, Sam. We haven't done this for a long time, but I will have yeah. to leave a link in the description. There right. is a free shit alert, which oh damn, <laughs> yeah, free shit. Wow, I've really... We've been so long without one of those, I hadn't even made a new stinger for it. I'm going to have to do that hey. after this. But you saw the old one? <laughs> the old one was just us shouting, Free shit! Oh, yeah, that's very true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... from uh, I found out from Wargamers... This, news site here but there's a free D, D adventure that continues the story of the 1980s tie-in cartoon so like a, a, everyone's familiar with this uh with the 1980s D, D show yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so the memes it, go crazy <laughs> uh yeah uh, i do think that uh watsy needs to 
stop and just let it die. Like the show was not that good. Please stop pretending that it was. <laughs> like no, it's a classically bad. Yeah, you know, like you, like you watch it now, you're like, oh my god, is this horrible? But as a kid, it's horrible. yeah, it was, it was kind of fun, <laughs> but also so dated and uh, yeah. Ugh. Oh, like absolutely. The, the plots on it were really bad. Yeah. Yeah, like session <laughs> one. Know, it's just it's, something cool to have. Yeah, like session one. There, 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 there's Tia Matt, and then that that deadpan, uh, like saying just like barely any emotion oh no it's tia matt <laughs> like that's become a meme in uh with between my dad and me because like uh, he decided to s sit down and watch it with my brother uh not too long ago and he was just blown away by how like uh, all the <laughs> it, how it didn't hold up and then there's just these stupid things like oh no it's tia matt like, excuse me, if Tia Matt shows up, it's not, oh no, it's Tia Matt. It's, oh, oh fuck, fuck. Get the f let's get out of here. <laughs> it's, it, it's crazy. But, so, this, it's basically a little module adventure that is supposed to be a uh, kind of a one shot type deal with pre gen okay. characters from the 90s cartoon. As well as, uh, it seems to be very geared towards Gen X fans of uh, the game and whatnot. Yeah, right. As you might expect. Remind me, which which generation is Gen X? Uh, our parents' generation. Oh, okay. Because, uh, well, my parents, uh, I, I'm a millennial. I don't know about you, Sam. When were you born? Millennials, like, what, like, 97, 96? I think that's around the cutoff. Oh, uh, yeah, I think I'm a... Whatever 98 is. Janet's movie? <laughs> yeah, right on the edge. <laughs> yeah, right. That's pretty much the cusp, I'll guess. Yeah, and Gen yeah. X is going to be before that, right? So it's like the 70s through the 80s. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Millennials. But if, if you <laughs> happen to like the, <laughs> the animated series and want to see uh, some fun stuff come fun. out of that, you know, like it, it might be a, a fun little one-shot. Get get some of your uh, get some parents that used to watch the show back in the day kind yeah. of into it. Like, you know, oh, it's a man. good way for some of our listeners to kind of drag their parents into the hobby if they don't have enough friends. Because Lord yeah. knows, a lot of people in this generation don't have enough friends, <laughs> like, or you know, don't have good relationship with their parents. You know, bonding time. Yes, and so we can like a shared interest. Yeah. We can fix families and the loneliness epidemic. <laughs> exactly, it's this could do great things. Yeah, D and D solves all <laughs> education, loneliness, family bonding. But all you need is D and D in your life, man. Like, I mean, <laughs> hell, we had a therapist come on uh, months ago. Yeah, I'm using D and D oh, man, for therapy. That's that's wild. So this is uh, going to be, let's see, looking, going through the article right here. There's a free module? Oh, yeah, there's a module for it. And they're nice. adding a new hero called Nico for a cleric because there was not a cleric in the original party. Nice. Huh. I, That's I, good. They're like, I let's think it's interesting. help this party out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, they, they got a... They gotta find uh, the the unicorn's horn because uh, taking him because the, the the magic powers of the unicorn have been taken away. So that that little uh, <coughs> that little dopey unicorn uni in the show uh, loses its horn in this adventure here. My God, I forgot about that. <laughs> it's like they, I don't even understand why there is a unicorn in the party. Uh, it, it, it was a different time. In, a fun fact about that show, like uh, two of the classes that they had for the show were like just barely released eh, as they were airing it. Like they were just put out in like a magazine, so they weren't even a part of the original set. So uh, I don't know if you saw in the chat, Ryan. I don't want to cut you off. Oh, go ahead. Go so. We should, um, where can the people find you, you know? Well, hey, guys, first of all, thanks for yeah, having me on. You. And I'm real easy to find. You could find me at jvhilliard.com. And if you're looking for my books, just Google my name. Or you can also Google the Warminster Saga, and it'll get you the, 
the first four and the first two are uh, Amazon bestsellers. The third and fourth are on their way, hopefully. And then Ooh. in 2026, the AR game will come out. Um, the AR, series, which okay. I've, I'm uh, interested in that. Yeah, they're, 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 Any audio yeah. books? I do a lot yeah, of driving. <laughs> yeah, pl- the audio books for the first three are out. The last one will come out right around the holidays this year. Ooh. And then a graphic novel will also be out in 2026. So uh, hang tight. Damn. More more to follow. Uh, awesome. I, you know what? I might have to talk to you about uh, uh, who you're going through for the graphic novel because uh, me and a buddy are working yeah. on a uh, series and uh, still hey, look, uh, looking for need, artists uh, and a publisher. For an <laughs> me yeah, and check out movie. Glass House. They're located in Florida. Awesome. Yeah, man. Thanks awesome. for coming. It was great meeting you. Yeah, yeah, my right, pleasure, Jess. Thanks again. I appreciate the time. Yep, good luck on the show. Thanks. All right. What a nice guest. Yeah, right. It's a cool guy. I didn't realize he was so famous. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> Look, if he if he ever needs some narrator <laughs> for audio. Oh please, I'm not touching another audio book for a while. <laughs> my life needs to be in check first. <laughs> Show my way, please. <laughs> All right. Let's jump into our generic realm. And it's we can cap good. things off. Generic realm. Generic realm. Lots of fun. Excellent. Mm-hmm. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> it feels um, good to be back. Uh, it, it's been a bit. Life's been hectic. New school year and everything. But... yeah. Being back, uh, as everyone knows, I love me a good homebrew spell. Something low-level that can really kind of kick in early on. And that's why I present to you the... That's the wrong one. Let me just... Hold on. Where? where, Excuse me? There it is. Now I can pull it up. I present Powderline, first level conjuration spell. Now, Powderline uh, requires one action and has a range of 15 feet. Verbal, somatic, and material components, the material being a pinch of gunpowder, and lasts for one round. You create a 30 foot long, 5 foot wide line of coarse black powder originating from a point within range. Uh, For the duration of the Uh, For the duration, the powder turns the ground in that area into difficult terrain. At the beginning of your next turn, the line sparks and explodes. Each creature within five feet of the line must make a dexterity saving throw, taking 3d8 fire damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. And like most spells, it scales scales as you uh, cast a higher slot. So... Look, One man, every, every party is probably going to have a situation where you need a timed explosive, okay? Look, <laughs> this <Yeah>. is, <laughs> you have a six-second fuse on this. You could do so much. <laughs> like, I, I love the aspect of just set it, run, <laughs> forget it, because next turn it's going on. has a pretty good range, man. 15-foot range with a 30-foot line, that's, that's fucking yeah, that's good. Yeah, a 30-foot line could be whatever direction you want. So you yeah. could just... Uh, I bet you can get real creative and curve that shit around corners. Uh, I I would say, like, as far as... Uh, yeah, I mean, if you angle it correctly, I, I picture it as, like, okay, we're running, we're running. Oh. The sorcerer uh, just puts the hand to the ground, casts it, creates a line in front of the doorway, and everyone just dashes off. At all the enemies chasing you, and kaboom, as right at the doorway. Yeah, you could do a lot of great things with this. That'd be really cool. My wife has put a mouse on my shoulder. Oh, cute. <laughs> hey, mouse. Here, let's get you up here. Yeah, I would give that a... Uh, 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 give that like not in my nine. sleeve. It would be very useful. I didn't want a mouse on my sleeve. No, no. You know, as the, the, the you one know, many... time I wear <laughs> long sleeve shirts, and this is what I get. And look, many wizards and you know sorcerers out there love the fireball spell. This could work very well with that. <laughs> like, 
would you would you rule that any fire spells casted like in the area would set it off early? Yes, or absolutely. If you I combo with someone good. who's got a candle or fire bolt, I'd let this go yeah. off the same round that it's cast. Yeah, or I would say like you know, it just adds like an extra you know damage or whatever. <laughs> that would be dope. I like that. Somehow I knew my wife would put a mouse on my head. <laughs> Yeah, and as is, you know, very uh, usual for us, I feel like you usually bring in, like, the spells and, like, the, uh, the items and stuff. I usually like to bring in, you know, weapons or, you know, things like that. Oh, for sure. And If you're all good, I'll go ahead and get into mine. Oh, yeah, sure. Let me just uh, pull it up, but go right ahead. Yeah. So we got Heart of the Zombie Dragon. Wanderous item, legendary, requires attunement by a spellcaster. Let me zoom in a little bit here. Oh, absolutely. And I can zoom in on this so our viewers can see. So, crafted from the heart of a zombie dragon, this crystalline focus pulses with necrotic energy that has been transformed to a source of potent magic. It is said to bind the wearer to the ebb and flow of life and death, granting them powers over the primal forces. While attuned to the heart, you gain the following benefit. And just for anyone who doesn't know, uh, spellcasters do usually need some kind of a spellcasting focus um, to be held while casting or on their person. Um, so yeah, this could be very cool. You pull out this beating purple heart, you know, <laughs> and you cast your spells through it. That would be very cool. <laughs> that is metal as fuck. Honestly. So we have first perk is necrotic absorption. You have resistance to necrotic damage. In addition, when you would take necrotic damage, you can use a reaction to take no damage instead. And you regain hit points equal to the damage you would have taken. Once this property is used, it cannot be used again until the next dawn. Mm. That's nice. pretty nice. So next up we have uh, Leech Life. Oh, sorry, Life Leech. Uh, when you cast a spell of first level or higher, you gain a number of hit points equal to the spell's level. When you hit a creature with a melee attack, you deal an extra 1d8 necrotic damage to the target, regaining a number of hit points equal to the necrotic damage dealt in this way. Okay, so, so this I'm stacks already, very well with the necrotic I'm already loving class for wizard. The, uh, the kind of like, cause sorcerers and wizards, you know, they're squishy, right? Give mm. them some, some life steal. This is how you offset that. Yeah, like a, like I said, for a necromancy wizard, this yeah, is it's a It's very on brand. It's very, very on brand. So next we have Summon Guardian Spirit. You can use an action to tap into the heart's powers to summon a spirit guardian in the form of an ethereal dragon for up to one hour. The guardian acts on its own initiative and follows your commands. Uh, using the, the statistics of a wraith, once this property is used, it cannot be used again until the next dawn. So that's pretty cool. You know, wraiths are pretty interesting. They are, for sure. And I, I was kind of expecting it to be like, you know, use the stats of like a zombie dragon laying or something, you know. But uh, this is this is cool. I like the wraith idea. Yeah, it's not too much. Yeah, yeah I feel like the dragon summon a little bit, a little much. But I mean, it is a wondrous legendary. Item, so fair I mean, enough. The the heart of a zombie dragon basically tells you exactly where you're gonna find it too. I mean, yeah. So you just, find like a, an ancient lich. He probably has one of these. You know? Or you could just go find a zombie dragon and then you take out its heart. It's a more fun way to do it. So we have Deathly Dominion. You can use an action of you can use an action during your turn to cast the finger of death spell without expending a spell slot. Once this property is used, it cannot be used again until the next dawn. So free finger of death. <laughs> Cracked. So next we have Eternal Cycle. When you die, you are resurrected after 1d4 days and location within 500 feet of the heart, provided no other creature attuned to it in the meantime. If your body was destroyed, it is completely reformed, emerging from a cocoon formed by the artifact's deathly energies. Once this property is used, it cannot be used again for one year. Hmm. So we have limited immortality. <laughs> this essentially becomes a phylactery for you. Which I think is interesting. Hey, that's step one right there. No, and it doesn't give any specifics 
to like the process of the attunement so i feel like it gives a lot of leeway to the dm to make it like mm. you may die just trying to attune to this. i like the concept of that because just too. the the louis the leeway as to how you attune to something maybe attunement needs to be a little bit more in depth when you, you know what i could see that and me personally i always try to like add a little bit of flavor to it, you know, more than just like you pick up a magic weapon, you know, you get used to how it looks, you know, things like this that are like affecting not just your powers and your abilities, but like your fucking, your life and your death literally is kind of crazy. Oh, it's absolutely. the whole process of, you know, like becoming a lich, you know, it's crazy. It's all... So last but not least, we have cursed, curse of eternal thirst. The bearer of the heart developed a craving for life force of others. When using any of the heart's abilities, you must succeed in a DC 15 wisdom saving throw or be compelled to drain life from a living creature within the next 24 hours. If you oh. fail to do so, you gain one level of permanent exhaustion, which permanent. cannot be removed by oh, means shit. short of a wish spell. That's interesting. I like yeah, that. I, <laughs> you know, we were talking about repercussions. Oh, man. <laughs> repercussions yeah yeah i think this is dope this is, uh, this is really cool i i can imagine like you find you know a lich who's been living in this castle for thousands of years he's used his heart you know to fell to fell fucking armies or whatever but he has he's on like his last point of exhaustion he doesn't want to kill anyone anymore you know he's like here take this you know, from me or whatever. Do something yeah. for me to claim this. You know, deem yourself worthy, and I'll perform the attunement process for you. Like oh, I feel like you could do, <laughs> you could do so much with this. Yeah, I like it a lot. Uh, so, who made this? So we featured uh, stuff from this person before uh, on Reddit slash or user slash two nine three six. That is like slash like spelled out like the guitar oh, slash. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, we've talked about some stuff from him before. Uh, uh, this is come, or this is come. <laughs> this comes from the Grimoire of Curses, a compendium featuring over 300 pages of content, now available on Patreon and drive through RPG. All right. Uh, this so this was posted about four it, months like, ago. So, you know, good luck with You know what? If this is any indicator for the other stuff in the book, I'm yeah. sold. That's awesome. Yeah, honestly, I really like it. I would give this, I would put this, just putting it in my games as something that exists, I like. I can't wait for you to pick up your game again. I know, me too. Wait for us to get into the uh, the Monster Hunter one. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. And then, like, a, I don't think I read off the thing. Uh, Abzokith is the uh, Reddit user that put together the powder line. So shout out to Abzokith for, uh, I like the spell. I'm saving that one. Yeah. yeah these are cool. Awesome. So anything else uh, before we uh, call it good for the day, Sam? Oh, I, I imagine you have some prep to do if we're still doing D&D this morning. Uh, we are doing D&D. &D. Right. So <laughs> uh, any listeners out there, be on, the, <laughs> be on the watch for the repeat stream where we <laughs> play our one piece D&D in about <laughs> an hour, hour and a half. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. This was a fun one. It feels good to be back. It's been a little bit, you know, yeah. like you said, life has been crazy for pretty much both of us. I imagine, you know, a lot mm. of people out there, if we have any like dedicated fan listeners are wondering, you know, what's going on. Feel free to call us at our uh, we are voicemail. Sorry. Let us know how disappointed you are. We love to hear it. <laughs> For you know, for the people who do continue to follow us and listen, thank you. We love you and appreciate you. We we honestly do like it. There's not much validation in the internet space unless you have a big following. So yeah. every little bit's there. Like it, <laughs> it's validating. I, I like it. <laughs> and in turn, you know, we validate you as well. Good luck in your games. Enjoy. You know, we have like Halloween coming up pretty soon. I'm excited Ooh. for that. Halloween one shot, maybe? Who knows? Oh, I would love to be involved in something. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to run one, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. 
Are you? Do you have any plans for? I know we're a little early, but I, I have no worry. plans. But we'll figure something out. Yeah, I know uh, Sianna is going to be having a Halloween party as she does. And she's been getting our costumes ready. Sianna she's knows somebody, how to do a costume, so I, I, I'm excited to see how we, those costumes. Come we're out. both going to be doing like a moth slash Mothman thing. Ooh. So she got these uh, like fur shawls, I guess that she cut. Ooh, I like the sound of black. that. Well, anyway, everybody, we'll see like y'all everybody. next time. <laughs> yep. Not next Later. week, because I can't guarantee. <laughs> we will try. <laughs> we, we try. <laughs>